You see, you see, you see, you see, you see.
Okay. So I went down a rabbit hole. Uh, one of the oldest pieces of tractor is this registry. Um, which is a little hard to describe. It's it's kind of a lightweight dependency injection system. Um, it was loosely inspired by the a library called Inject that Facebook made, and I kind of copied a, a subset of it and ended up simplifying it and then I've simplified it a couple of times um, and then yesterday I both simplified it and sort of renamed stuff so um, basically it's a registry of entries and what I learned is that we can mostly ignore all of this. It's all about the actual reference that it points to. So for the most part, it's a pointer to a value, is all an entry is. And so you can create a registry that will register a bunch of values. You can get those entries out as entries. And then the interesting things that we can do with it, um, one is assignable to. So given a type, uh, it's going to give us a list of entries or references that, um, that would be assignable to that type. Um, and so you can see it's actually going through entries and just running assignable two on its reflected value. Um, there's a special case where if the type is a slice um, and now or an array, what it's going to compare is the element type of the slice or array. Um, that's used in populate uh, which will take some value and we assume that it's a pointer to a struct and we iterate over the fields and for fields that are uh, uh, not set, we run the type through assignable2 and we get all the units that are assignable to it. And if it's not a slice, then we set that field's value to the first assignable unit or value that we got here. If it's a slice, then we populate the slice with all the ones that matched. So the slice thing is kind of what I added to the, what inject used to do was basically just setting the value. Um, I added being able to set uh, slice values because this lets you do stuff like hooks. And you can say like, here's a hook um, of all the, let's say initializers. An initializer is an interface with a method initialize. So now it kind of goes through everything in the registry to see basically what assignable is doing. It's going through and seeing who implements uh, initialize. And then self-populate is basically going through all the entries in the registry and then calling populate on each of them. So basically, you have all these values. <laughs> 
and they might want to have other values that could be satisfied by these other ones and so we're basically just wiring them all together based on their types um, of their on their fields and then lastly we have a, a way to kind of get like a single value out which previously it was um, given a, a reflect value um, then we'll go in and, and find that value and, and give it to you so that's kind of all it does um, and it turns out it can be even simpler than this like all of this is really unnecessary all, a lot of this um, and then I also part of the reason why I was trying to do this and refactoring was um, I wanted to normalize all entries to actually be a pointer so here it just assumes that it's a, a value it can be any value um, and it makes most sense for them to be pointers uh, or references, but um, I wanted to make it so that you could give non-pointer values and then it would make it a pointer value. Um, and then that led me down a rabbit hole because I had made this comment a while ago of how I would kind of rename stuff here. Like I don't know what the package name would be, but I was like, maybe call it a, maybe still call it a registry. Um, Actually, no, this is an old comment. There was another, there was a version of this comment that I modified in more recent code. Oh, yeah, because this is an old tractor. Um, where I started calling it an assembly. And I started calling the, um, started calling the things that you put into it units. And so I figured maybe I'll just do all that renaming. And then also, I ended up being simple enough, um, you know, and core to what Tractor Engine does. I decided to put it in that package. So this is the new version. Unit is a reference to a struct, usually a struct. That's not it's sort of useless if it's not a struct, or maybe useless if it's not a struct, but. Um, there's this unit from which whenever we add units to the assembly now it goes through this which is basically using reflection to see is it a pointer um, then we'll just you know kind of cast it to a unit if not we'll make a new value based on its type um, that is a that is basically a reference uh, value and then set it, what it's pointing to to the value that came in and return that so it's sort of normal normalizing anything that comes in as as a pointer so then we rename assembly and notice how simple it is unit is just an interface I wanted to do something like this but that just makes things more complicated and doesn't actually um, help it just makes things more difficult um, so an assembly is just a bunch of units. Um, let's start safe. We can get the units out. Um, I push the concept of main into the assembly because it seemed to make sense and it's kind of helpful. So a convention while doing this iteration of tractor is the first unit added is main and then that's you you know that's actually added to this engine main variable it's kind of a global reference so that you can get to more or less the user's main um, but because that pattern comes up later on in larger structures because of all the self similarity in this thing um, it actually made sense to put it on here so that's all this does is main gives you the first unit um, adding units which runs it through that unit from normalizes them into point pointers um, signable to is about as simple as it was um, although now we support arrays 
populate's been renamed to assembly or assemble. So assemble will take a value. Um, you make sure that it's a pointer. We make sure it's pointing to a struct. Um, and then kind of a simplified version from before. We go through the fields. We ignore things that are not nil. Um, we get all the assignable units for that field type. If it's a slice, then we populate it. If it's a pointer, we set that pointer value to the to the unit because the unit is a pointer. Um, if it's not a pointer, then we actually try and set the value. I don't know how useful that is, but we'll see. Um, sort of a way to get a copy of what's in the assembly. Self-assemble makes them all assemble themselves. And I don't know if this is going to work because I remember I there might have been some deal with addressability, but as long as you're as long as you're always passing a pointer or a reference to some value, which could itself be a pointer, um, you can pass it in without working with a reflect type. Um, so this is a way to get something out uh, of the assembly uh, without going through assemble. So if you don't have a struct that you want to populate the fields of. So again, that's all it does. Now it's a part of engine, which is kind of nice. So we deal with engine unit, engine assembly. Apparently engine new now returns an assembly. I moved Damon out of internal because I wanted it to live under engine. Damon was originally meant to potentially be part of this unit oriented design philosophy is that when you're designing these units, they aren't necessarily tied to any kind of framework. Um, there isn't any dependency to engine or assembly here because all it is is defining some interfaces that we use as fields in our struct and then a you know a third party wires them up um, more or less like an automated version of what you would normally do if you were to create some kind of software component or unit and it had all of its dependencies defined maybe not in the constructor because we don't have constructors in Go in the same way. New is really just a convention. Um, and I always hated dependency injection for really muddling with your constructor's API. It's like, okay, here's the constructor as you'd normally use it plus tons of dependency, you know, if you have tons of dependencies, and I have to provide all of these. Um, which I know makes sense. But because a lot of the dependencies are optional. Anyway. But this is one of the first sort of now what I call units. It was made for this system. Um, and is the first good example of like a framework. So like if I were to talk about sort of the architecture, you know, of the tra of Tractor Engine, 
you know, it's based on this sort of dependency injection system based on assembly. Um, and from that, we build stuff like this. And, you know, this could be a component that does whatever, but um, for components that don't really do anything but provide services for other things um, that are that really don't do anything on their own, that are populated by other things in the assembly, um, you know, other services or whatever that they're going to run, call them frameworks. Not unlike how Apple calls some of their big libraries frameworks because that's how their operating system was designed using a sort of perspective of object-oriented programming where you create not just objects, but you create objects that serve other objects or provide a framework for other objects so that your objects don't have to do so much. So we're kind of recapturing that idea here. So anyway, uh, there's really kind of two paths when you're making a program. Is it a command line program, which could include interactive command line programs, um, pretty much anything that runs on the command line is command line program, um, uh, in a way including long-running processes. But long-running processes are very different because unlike a command line program or command, it, it has a start and stop, right? That's the main difference is a command is something that is usually run by a user often. Um, which then also, it might be interactive, it might not, it might be a, have a run in a pseudo terminal, um, or a terminal, um, but eventually it ends, right? Whereas a long running process, it really only ends if it crashes or needs to be restarted or whatever. The whole point is it's going to run for a long time. And the only kind of like in between are applications. Um, but for the most part, uh, applications really qualify more as a long running process because they're basically running as daemons behind the scenes and running for as long as you want that program um, to be running. And you don't really interact with it the same way as you would a command line program. So uh, daemons also include those kinds of long-running processes or applications. And the core of them is that they are going to do some long-running thing. And often, these are servers, you know? Um, and so a very common API for servers is serve. Um, if you're more modern, you take a context so you know when you might need to shut down. And so from that, we can get this concept of a service and say that the daemon framework is something that just runs services. Um, some services, though, might need some kind of boot up or sh shut down. And so we have these optional interfaces that can be implemented. So when something is added to this framework, it can implement any or all of these, and it will be added to these appropriate slices here. And then used when we say run, um, we go and we run the initializers um, after we do a bunch of other stuff that you normally need to take care of uh, for like a long running process or daemon like handling signals and wiring that up to shutting things down um, when you do shut down waiting for things to kind of shut down together so everything's shut down um, you know if you say terminate everything go and 
try and terminate everything. So it's very simple, um, but almost any long running process could benefit from this. So it becomes sort of like the first useful unit in this, and often the sim you know the simplest tractor engine program would be one that has main and daemon or something like that. But actually, an engine when we run, um, and this is I don't know how long it'll work like this, but you don't have to specify daemon. It's sort of always assumed that you'll have daemon in there. Um, it might not be used, or you might not start running the daemon, but it's added to your units. And then a command line framework is added as well, because no matter what, you're usually always running this from a command line. Even if you're running a daemon, you usually so you could write a program that doesn't that is a daemon that doesn't use a CLI framework, but then you're not going to have you know then you'd be on your own for setting up version flags, you know, all of that stuff, subcommands. And I want to have something that is very minimal and has no dependencies, but for now I'm just wrapping Cobra for that CLI framework. So those are sort of the two built-in units that you always get. But I'm trying to decide maybe at some point I would make you have to explicitly use them or detect you know if main has serve then use the daemon framework I don't know now they're built in and really in kind of the concept of the engine running there's two initializers hooks so, um, originally, you know, everything's added to the assembly, and then we do self-assemble, and then we go over everything that implements an initializer and call initialize, so that's a great sort of like constructor alternative place to initialize internal state or whatever. Um, but I recently started feeling a need for a pre-initialize, something that happens before dependency injection that you'd really only use if you knew that you were using dependency injection and you'd want to do something before it. One of the things that this used to do was there was it used to be another interface called extra components. Where would that live? Did that even exist? So if you provided extra components or extra units, um, you could create a, a unit that had this method and then provide more units. So it's basically sort of saying, here are some units that I depend on. So for example, the web view is a unit and in this version it, it depended on two other units uh, an RPC framework and a file system watching service where we were centralizing any file system watches In the new version, that dependency has been sort of removed because it's been put under our new file system abstraction. So it's really uh, decentralized in, in how you use it. If you have a top level file system that you use for everything, that would be where all the watches live. The idea being that in Tractor, there would be a lot of times when you want to watch the file system for all kinds of different things. And I didn't like the idea of having all of these watchers with their own loops and everything that are con you know, 
depending on how it's done, if you're polling, then you've got all of these things running a, a, a near tight loop, you know, do, and depending how fast you want it, the loop, loop might be really tight. And if you have all of them all over the place, it gets out of control. So I had this idea of centralizing it as kind of a top level service, you know, background support service. But that's kind of refactored now and will be sort of implicitly centralized uh, if we centralize access to the file system. Um, instead of having a basically by having Tractor provide access to to the file system through providing a file system uh, abstraction if that makes sense um, which might even be part of env um, I mean it already kind of is here this placeholder thing which I still need to actually do the other things that this package does but Here, for example, you don't ever have to worry about doing get working directory because apparently in Tractor, we're always going to check what the current working directory is. And then we make that accessible at end of current path. But of course, you usually want to use a file system to work with it directly, do an open or whatever. And so we provide that as well as a file system, which happens to have a, a watch on it. So there's this long-term idea of maybe having an abstraction of all files go through something like maybe assets or something like that so that maybe you're always working with assets or something. But for now, at the very least, um, you know, we're sort of centralizing some of the common places that you would access the file system. And so those watchers, you know, there would only be one for however many of these that we make. And then there could even be a mechanism to have them all share the same loop or something. Anyway, um, so this idea of having extra components or dependencies, and the thing is, is that we're we're trying. I'm trying to keep even though it's you know unlikely that you would ever use these without the engine and the assembly and, and stuff like that. Um, I want them in the way that dependency injection does by design allow you to sort of independently use the units um, without a framework or whatever. So you can just set up those dependencies on your own. Um, and so If you weren't running this and extra components was not run, then you'd have to just make sure to set up those dependencies on this uh, unit before you use it or test it or whatever. Um, and there's some idea of later on, you know, there might be something that says, oh, if there's already a framework then we'll ignore, you know, if there's already an RPC framework, we'll ignore the one that's coming from extra components and we'll just leave the one that's already in there so that when the assembly happens, it'll use the one that's already in there, already in the assembly. Um, so I was kind of going down that path, making that happen.
I got rid of the extra components interface and everything. Um, and even tried setting up the RPC framework and initialize and the program didn't work. And it didn't work because um, by just creating our own instance of this framework, it's not participating in the other hooks. So you can't really just create an instance of RPC framework and assign it and have that be good enough because that framework might have hooks like initialize daemon. And so because we're not actually adding it to our assembly, uh, it's not getting added into the daemon framework and so it's not getting uh, an initialize. And so it turns out, yeah, we do, it does have a initialized daemon that sets stuff up. And so my program was not working because the framework was not totally set up. So, um, The where I'm at now is this idea that I was you might have saw source for is that maybe in these cases where we have these dependent units and again we use the term unit to imply that it is going to be treated in the way that we talked about. It's going to have this dependency injection. Um, it's going to have hooks that might be made to work with other units. And so units really are designed to work in an ecosystem of other units. And so, you know, we, we can still test them independently, but we have to be aware of that, that we'd have to, if we create, you know, an RPC framework, we'd have to be sure we call daemon initialize on it um, and stuff like that so I've also been playing with this idea of having a reference to the assembly which is useful in cases where for example you want to get access To some, to you know, some other service, but you don't want it to be in. It's starting to kind of defeat the purpose of having those dependencies explicitly defined there. Um, but for example, if you were to do this on main, you know, on main, if we wanted access to our RPC framework, then we'd create a field, and it would have to be public. And because main is serialized to push its state to the front end, um, some of these units, especially, you know, daemon and stuff like that, you would start getting into circular dependency, you know, circular references, um, and, you know, just very complicated things you don't necessarily want serialized and sent out to the front end. And even though this idea that, like, you know, there would be a hook so that you could change it so that it doesn't serialize main, it serializes some some other value provided by a method um, I wanted to provide an alternative way to access stuff from the registry so it seemed like a pretty clever you know simple building on itself idea to then just have a reference to the assembly um, because then you can use value 2 to get things out of it um, and so then the idea was, well, what if components that depend on these other um, units, uh, that they could use this pre-initialized hook, so before assembly happens, to create its own assembly using this reference so in this case, this is 
you know, in, in a standalone scenario, WebView will have its own assembly uh, in which we can put the RPC framework that it depends on. And I don't know, you know, what how you would then, you know, I, I, I guess you'd have to, I don't know where or who would be responsible for then saying units assemble, you know, WebView, but that's a pretty easy thing. You could basically do that and in, in initialize or pre-initialize or even outside of uh, the WebView in the test or whatever that you're doing this. But um, this felt like it was getting somewhere because what we could do is instead of having the extra components or extra units method, we can just say, oh, if if a unit has a reference to an assembly and it's populated um, before we've done assembly, which means it used pre-initialize to create its own assembly and put some stuff in it. We can, in our engine when we run, after pre-initialize but before self-assemble, we can go through all our units, um, look for assembly references, get all the units out of those, and then add them to our top level assembly, and then replace that reference to an assembly with the top level assembly. So it's basically merging them So any units that it would expect to have, it would still have, but you're now, it also has other stuff. Um, and then this is still kind of aligned with the idea of having a reference to the assembly. So for the most part, you kind of imagine that there's always generally one top level assembly but when you're not running the program normally, a unit can have its own assembly, potentially for its dependencies. I haven't worked out all the details because I don't do testing like that yet, but this feels like a solid direction and it will solve the problem of having units be able to define their own dependencies of other units that they kind of need to work um, and then make sure that those dependencies end up in the top level assembly so that they're added to daemon framework and etc so that they're daemon initialize and everything else is called. So I'm kind of setting all of this up. And then the only thing I need to do is this part. And so I've been writing what we're gonna do here. So that only took 40 minutes to explain, but um, you know, that's a pretty good introduction to the core architecture of Tractor Engine, at least, which is ripples throughout the rest of Tractor. And describes what I'm going to be working on today. And hopefully I'm not going to mess too much more with assembly because I was working with it a lot yesterday, dealing with, you know, I keep thinking I've finally mastered go reflection and then I always prove myself wrong especially dealing with pointers and stuff so um, I think it's in a good state and I think that it should work um, like this so you know one of this new refactoring allows you to call engine run without 
creating references. This is how you'd always have to do it before. You'd have to create references to those, which is more or less unnecessary because we're not going to use those references anywhere else. And so now that the assembly actually normalizes them to pointers, so that in the assembly they are a pointer and that we kind of use that pointer everywhere we need a reference to them, um, that we can kind of pass these in by value because often, if anything, these are just setting some initial values or whatever here. So it's okay if those are copied. And in cases where you actually do need a reference because you're doing something weird and you need to reference it later, you know, you can still do that. Um, and it should work. But I like this just because it means that it's slightly simpler syntax, especially for people that are new to Go or new to programming in general. I didn't really want to have to explain what this is all about. Um, and it's just kind of ugly having a bunch of these here. So there's just something in the back of my mind that it all kind of all came together and so finally executed on it, but it required basically doing all this refactoring, which took all of yesterday and, and a little bit more time. And so now I think it's mostly working. I just have to write this code. And then after that, we can get back to working on Workbench because it'll actually work again um, and kind of get to the next piece of the puzzle, which some people might have saw us work on recently, was this command framework. So Tractor, just to get all the explaining out of the way. Tractor has a... Um, and again, this is last year's version of Tractor, which was, you know, a prototype, or you could call it a, uh, not a sprint, but a spike, you know. And I got it to a certain point in order to be able to experiment at that point, but I didn't necessarily take as many, take as much time with a lot of the decisions leading up to it. So a lot of what this year has been has been starting over from scratch and taking the time to build it up again um, so that not only is there a lot of thought put into the user experience when you're not using all of this other stuff, you know, being able to, you know, the to-do app example and stuff like that, but that all of the APIs up to this point are then further iterated on and simplified and stuff like that, exactly like what I did with the registry slash assembly uh, package I was just talking about. So a much higher level kind of shared system in Tractor is a uh, command framework. And this isn't a command line framework, although they overlap. A command line subcommands could come from commands. The commands I'm talking about here are much more like VS Code's concept of commands, which again are basically any command that you can do in VS Code, whether it's a menu, uh, anything in here, those are all wrapping commands. And then, of course, the command palette, which lets you, nope, nope. You know, the command palette, all of these are basically, and keyboard shortcuts, right? They're all, it's all based on commands. And so VS Code has a system where you define those commands. You know, it's just something like a function. Uh, that's registered with an ID. It's a register command. 
and then they make it annoying if you want to add extra metadata you have to put it in the uh, package.json which means you don't really have as much runtime access to it and I forget why they do it this way but that's super annoying that's also where you would put metadata used by the command palette to define like the context that it might be available stupid um, but the same general idea is a system like that to where we can define any kind of user action we can define it as a command and so the old version of this framework was you know pretty simple we had a command definition that had some of that metadata we had a, we had the id we had a label we had a category even um, a description and then it just has run which takes a function and i was playing with this idea of um you know, I love one of the extra, you know, if you typed languages are great for, for various reasons in terms of like um, uh, quick checking of, of correctness. Um, but it's also just extra metadata that's useful for things like documentation. That's why I'm porting all of the components that I made in the old version of Tractor to TypeScript. Um, because it means that there's a little bit more structure to attach documentation to or generate documentation from and have descriptions of things and stuff like that because you can formalize interfaces yada 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 unfortunately in go uh with reflection at least you have no way you can get the types that uh a function uses in its arguments but you cannot get the names because uh, at runtime, it really doesn't care what the name of an argument is. Um, so in order to get the names of a function, that requires um, source level access, which is you know something that'll eventually come back around to Tractor. But um, I decided to try something else because I found out that if you if you if you make the if you make if you have a single parameter and make it a struct then you get the names because if you reflect on a struct you get the field names and then i realized what you can do inline structs in your function argument you know i i'd never seen that before but i started using that as a pattern in this case just because i was like well this means that um these command implementations these functions um, they'll actually have uh, names and types of their parameters so that even at runtime we can dynamically say oh this command takes an ID and a path and they're both strings and so it looks a little funky um, but it doesn't really matter that much Um, so here's a bunch of commands that were added for the old tractor and a lot of their implementation. So I learned a lot doing doing that. Um, the command system, the command framework itself doesn't really do much. Like a lot of frameworks, that really they just act as a registry. Um, and then there's a top level execute command where you give it an ID and then a map of parameters which since we're using reflection anyway we apply those to to create a struct and then pass that to the thing and so that way it works um, makes it a little bit easier to have kind of this dynamic structure uh, instead of having a struct right because you wouldn't know the struct uh, at this point and you're you use this for all possible commands so anyway this little system is kind of the next step because in workbench now that we have this kind of working outline 
and it's using something very close to the manifold data structure and we have an inspector and we have all those fields and um, they're sort of in a, a read only but we have all the different types most of the types ported um, you know I'm I'm gonna say I'll be done for now with this workbench demo prototype to just do object manipulation if I can create you know, a tree of objects and be able to rename them and move them, delete them. Um, you know, you can select them and I don't know what I'm going to put in the inspector, but um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to worry about the components that they have under them and the manifold data structure of objects and components. So I'll come back Basically, I'm trying to find a point where I'll, I'll be done working on this so that I can work on all the other stuff I need to do. Writing more documentation, writing more explanations and videos like this. Updating the Visual Go editor to this new framework um, and getting that working again. And maybe building a very simple text editor uh, as an example before this would be ready to start letting people in for private alpha of tractor toolkit so that's the workbench object demo is just being able to manipulate objects so now that you can view objects uh, you need to be able to mutate that state which you know we'll do through a context menu but those context menu um, actions will be defined by commands and so that's what I was working on uh, a new version of that um, one of the cool things that I that kind of came out of this was again trying to come up with a very generic this idea of a command again I already hinted at this you might have a command all of these all of these commands um, if any of them did something useful independently of this user interface maybe it would be nice to have access to those commands from the command line maybe they show up as a sub command so it would be really nice if commands made in this framework could also be used for command line commands and then thinking longer term because of some of the places that I want to go in the future, um, things like if this then that, the paradigm of um, triggers and actions, right? Um, which I spent a little bit of time working with some people a long time ago trying to come up with an open spec version of that paradigm um, this was even before we had good API schemas so it was very difficult and we are almost went in the direction of trying to create our own schema you know API schema definition but I got us to not do that instead focus on just what we would need to implement some kind of pipes the idea and the reason why it's called pipes was that there would be a, a sort of Yahoo pipes paradigm where the if this then that is just a simplified higher level layer on top of um, and so this design we were thinking in terms of like well we want to support the high level trigger and action paradigm but we also want to support much more complex flows and structures and stuff like that look at this 10 years old pipelines can be as simple as if this then that recipes are as complex as Yahoo pipes but they can also be blocks themselves and used in simpler and more complex pipelines when pipes is during complete um, 
Looks like we're using JSON schema, which is pretty smart. Yeah, we to define a block, which is basically if you were to think of an action or trigger or some kind of block in here, really, um, you know, it has properties. This looks like mostly metadata, but the main thing is inputs and outputs. And inputs are just basically a bunch of types, you know, some arguments. It's kind of neat that JSON schema is still around. This was very early in JSON schema draft three. I don't know how many drafts there are now, or I mean, we have some kind of official, I don't know, I'm curious. They changed to a date version of the draft. Anyway, JSON scheme is great. Um, I'm both happy and confused that um, what is it called? Throughout both names, what it used to be called and what it's called now. Swagger. Open API. Open API was originally its own thing, and then they adopted JSON schema, so now it's something on top of JSON schema. So it's more or less JSON schema, but with some extra structure. Most of it being really extra stuff, but just really being able to model any API. Anyway, it's good stuff. Not enough people use it. But that didn't exist then. But we did have JSON schema. Output definition. So now I'm curious what the pipeline definition was. This actually will be useful in Visgo because it basically needs a similar data structure being a, a block oriented pipeline thing. Um, so we have an array of blocks. Which have an ID and a URL to their definition. So we got a list of blocks. It looks like, oh yeah, the, the pipeline itself is more or less a block, so it has inputs and outputs. And then the pipes, let's see how this works. It's an array of basically block and output mappings. Yeah, between a block Output and value. Um, I suspect this could be for cases when you don't have a block and you just want the value. And then the block and the input on that block. Pretty straightforward, kind of dumb, uh, but it works. That's more or less what I ended up doing in Visgo as well. <laughs> 
fast, really. Um, 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 um. Uh, so the point of that was to talk about how I thought a lot about creating an open standard for that paradigm of high-level user and user programming, the trigger action paradigm, uh, and uh, sort of visual node-based um, stuff. Uh, oh, and the reason for that is because all of the actions that would be used in an if this then that or whatever um, would eventually map to you know APIs or you know really any useful function that you would want to call and so it would really suck if you had to create now another representation of everything so I really want to find a common thing for this idea of an action or a command or even you know the command line command um, and functions, you know, having that common thing, you can create something that can wrap functions to give you that same abstraction for all of those so that once you have that, you can use them across all of those systems, or at least that's, you know, what I hope, right? Is that if you make a command, you can then use the command from the command line, you can use the command from a user interface with a command palette, um, and then that, which of course you can then tie to a keyboard shortcut um, and be used in menus, um, but then also be the action in if this then that or Zapier style automations or whatever. Uh, or also like Apple shortcuts, which is, which is why I was looking at that the other day. Or Automator. Anyway, turns out here is what my sort of in very go style, here is my sort of proposal for generic action interface. It's something with a run method that returns an error. This came from the idea of modeling commands a little differently than I did last time where every command is a struct so if we're going to define a struct in the params of the function you know we might as well make it an actual struct instead of an inline struct so the parameters of the command is just the fields of the struct and then it implements run and then that's how it be run now delete would be an action which can be used as a command or whatever. Um, trying to make this work in other automation contexts um, work, you know, uh, uh, Apple shortcuts or Zapier, or if this, then that actions. There are cases, not all of them, but there are cases where there is a return value that you care about, right? Whenever you create a pipeline like an automator, um, Zapier, it's a little bit unclear how that works when you have multiple actions, how stuff is shared between them, but that's a general idea of you creating a pipeline, right? Thinking, think like Automator or whatever. And so it is kind of an interesting case um, because it's not necessarily needs to be a direct mapping to a return value from the function. Um, but my idea was, well, we could create a separate interface for actions that have a result, and maybe that, uh, you know, is result. And so run would basically maybe store something on the struct that's not exported and return, uh, and result would then return that. That's one idea. Um, but the cool thing about doing this this way is that run error if that looks familiar um, is also what is used 
to run a command. So when you're creating a subprocess in Go, you know, you create the struct, you set it up, and you can start it asynchronously and wait for it or whatever, but you can also run it, uh, which runs it synchronously and waits for an error. And isn't it cool that now in this paradigm, commands are now actions? Isn't that cool? We'll see. Um, but anyway, that's kind of where I, I was at with setting this stuff up. And so I just need to make a bunch of these. Um, but I had to create uh, an action framework or a command framework. And then I got to the point of, all right, how does this work in Workbench? I could put it in here, but then it's going to get into all kinds of potentially weirdness um, with exporting. Um, you know, I was thinking of, you know, maybe it's, run, you know, set up as another unit. I don't exactly know yet because one of the other things is it does sort of want to tie into RPC. And um, that's sort of related to the same problem I'm trying to solve with the web, web view UI thing. So I think I'm not going to solve that yet, but... Um, If, for example, it was put up here, you know, command framework or something like that, um, how would I get it here? Because if I did also just make a reference to it, um, you know, I sort of have the same problem. Basically, I'm trying to avoid it being crawled by the, by the, um, data exporter that, that sends stuff to the front end. And I know I already made mechanisms to do that by making it so that you don't put state in here. We could put it in like a sub, you know, maybe even as an inline struct. Um, kind of an interesting way to do Uh, private <laughs> fields, you know, instructs, which I sort of stumbled upon. Um, because it's inline, you can't really reference it uh, as a type, but you'd be able to do from the type uh, outline. Um, so, so that's interesting. That's one way to do state because you could do state like this and then have the state um, thing basically return you know a pointer to state um, and that protects the state uh, from dealing with other things that want exported stuff but that is weird even if it's cool that it works and is interesting. I'm not sure anybody, you know, I've not seen that anywhere. Nobody's talked about it. Um, it's an interesting pattern, but because of that, I don't really want to rely on it um, because I want things to look and feel relatively normal. So anyway, somehow that got me going down the path of the assembly stuff and so that's about all I'm going to explain what I'm going to try and do today. Actually I'm going to take a break <laughs> immediately because I'm already tired. But when I come back um, we'll try and get this working, try and get workbench working again and then keep moving forward on that command registry and build out the commands needed to manipulate objects in the workbench and then I'll be done with that for a while.
though. In fact, I'm gonna have a little snack. When I come back, I might decide to end this stream and start a new one so that this explanation can be in a standalone video and I can upload it to YouTube or whatever. We'll see. BRB.
I think I am going to end the stream, by the way. Because I wanted to not work all day today. This project is exhausting and stressful. And I almost wasn't going to work today at all because I've started taking Thursdays and Fridays off because I need at least a day to recover before I can even think about anything else because when I'm in this work stuff, I really can't think about anything else. I guess mindfulness is helping in practice, but... I was very hesitant to start the project and even with all the setbacks last year, it's sort of like, well, I can't. It's actually the case where it applies to, uh, to say, um, can't put the genie back in the bottle. Like once I've thought about it enough, it exists in my head that it would make absolutely no sense to continue living my life and not try and make it real. And it would tore, it would tear me up inside and torment me knowing that everything else that comes out, that comes closer, is just a shitty version of what I could have made for myself and everybody. And I would not be able to live with myself. I'd have to stop using technology entirely. And maybe that's a good thing. But then I had wasted half of my life. I mean, all of my life so far, but... Assuming I live to 70. Which, who knows if I keep going on this project. It's stressful, but I am trying to take care of myself, which is why I'm not going to be streaming for the rest of the day. So I'm going to shut this down and um, I might work on it because I've already put so much thought into it, but I might save it for tomorrow. I don't know. I'm very frustrated by the fact that I take so long thinking about all of these details and I'm building something so big and I have so little help and so I'm just rushing trying to get all this stuff done and it always feels like I'm going so slow and then other people on the outside are like, wow, you're really productive and fast. And I forget that I am pretty fast at a lot of things. Which also makes it a little bit frustrating to work with other people that don't work as fast, but I guess I need to be nice to myself. Anyway, I'm gonna go eat. Goodbye.